Hello, everyone. Namaste. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to this presentation. I tried to make it in between 45 minutes to an hour. My name is Kelly. These presentations, they never get easy. Like, they never do. Like, we keep doing them and we keep freaking out. So we're going to start for a minute or so just with a little breath work, just to center. Um, it's more for me than for anyone else. <laughs> so, so let's sit in a straight spine, like sit on, on something and cross your legs. <clears throat> then just sit on a, on a yogi like meditation position that feels comfortable to you right now, just for a couple minutes. Length the spine from the base up to the crown. Gently close your eyes, or if you're not comfortable in closing your eyes, look down to the floor. And gradually, when you're comfortable, see if you can gently close your eyelids. And just for a moment, make your body steady. And make your spine tall and steady. Now begin to notice your breath moving in and out of the nostrils, right at the base of the nose, in and out. Begin to feel that your breath has a temperature. When you breathe in, the breath feels like cooling and fresh. And when you breathe out, your breath feels warmer. And just do this for the next couple rounds. Inhale, you feel a fresh, cooling air moving into the nostrils. And breath out a little warmer. Now notice that your breath has like a texture, a feeling to it. And it's something that is making your breath to move. In yoga we call that prana or energy. It's creating the movement of your breath. Now the next time you breathe in, infuse your breath with light and energy. Notice that every time you breathe in, that energy moves from the base of the nose up to the eyebrow center on the third eye. And when you breathe out, the energy moves back from the third eye to the base of the nose. Repeat that for a minute. Inhale, energy move from the base of the nose up to the eyebrow center on the third eye. And exhale is from the third eye back to the base of the nose and just below the nostrils. Inhale from the base, energy awareness move up to the eyebrow center. Exhale is from the eyebrow center back to the base and just outside the nostrils. Please continue a couple rounds. Start to feel your breath infused with prana, light and intelligence. There is an awareness that starts to grow in the third eye center, in between the eyebrows. Now 
Now take a moment to relax your breath and remain with your presence on the third eye center, on the midbrain. If you feel like a light or energy is alive in that point. Intuitively draw that awareness from the midbrain down the spine towards your heart center. Feel a light and a presence in your heart. Draw your hands, palms together over the heart center. And from your heart, let's all chant together three sounds of the mantra Aum. So please take a full breath out. Take a nice deep inhale to begin the mantra. for the ones who arrived just now. Namaste to everyone. Good evening. I think that OM itself was Tantra, right? That was presumed. So here we go. Like, again, these presentations are never easy, especially when there is like all of these beautiful people here coming tonight. Do you want to come in? Come in, guys. Yeah. Come everyone in. So there is some spaces in here, guys. It's actually like that can fit ten people here. Yeah. Come in, guys. Thank you for coming. Hello. Okay. Wing. Come in, Hannah. Okay, so this presentation is an introduction, introduction to Tantra. You know, I, if I would look myself 10 years ago, fast forward to today, I think I'll never believe that I'll be doing a presentation on Tantra. I'll be thinking like, what are you little witch, mystic lady? Probably like you have 10 cats. And or you all sensual. You know, like I'll be thinking something like that. Completely different than actually what the experience with Tantra is. And, um, you know, I, I came to, to realize recently that there is many paths to self-realization. There is many ways to the path of self-realization. And Tantra is the one that I chose to help me to guide through this life in a way that I, I can live more consciously, that I can become a better human being. And by no means I have mastered it, by no means I know everything, I'm just a beginner. But I have experienced enough of this powerful practice that have influenced my life in so many levels 
on my yoga practice, on my personal life, on my professional life, that I believe enough in this path. And that's why I'm here tonight. And that's why I want to share with you something. My life never has been so intense, ever. It's a simultaneous like this dance in between fuck is shit. And at the same time, it's really amazing. It's like since I am into this path, more and more the things have been shown to me of what needs to be stripped out, what I, I need to look at it. But at the same time, I have been receiving like the most, most magnificent gifts, including you guys here tonight. It's, it's really special. I want to ask you guys, maybe some of you want to share with me, what do you think self-realization is for you? Does anyone want to give a shot? Go, Briar. Okay. We continue growing and acknowledging who you are, we are. Is it in? Yeah. Yeah, we are. We are. Yeah. Yeah, traditional um, Hatha Yoga Tantra says that ultimately who we are is a soul, who we always have been. And this soul um, wanted a personality, so it um, manifested a mind. It organized the laws of gunas to manifest a mind. And then this mind starts to vibrate in a certain frequency and gather the five elements, as you guys know, earth, fire, water, so on, and created this physical body. But the moment we are manifested as this physical body, when we are born, the path of forgetting that we are a soul begins. We begin to get conditioned by life, by our environment, by society, by our parents, by traumas. And we begin slowly to forget that which we are, we always have been. And the, the path of Tantra Hatha Yoga is to reverse back this engineer. So first, initially, yes, remember that we have a body, that we have this physical body, which is a vessel then you start to understand the energies in this body and you start to master the energy in this body. So it begins to influence the mind. Once the mind is tame or shaped, we can actually start to access meditation. And it's through meditation that we pass beyond, go to consciousness and access what's beyond consciousness, which is the soul or the God or the ultimate or the one. So initially we were there. And then we begin to get our layers. And then once we are born, if we are not seeking, perhaps, um, we're not going to remember who we truly, truly are. And that's the path of Tantra. So tonight I want to share like, some things that maybe is tangible in a way that we can understand how Tantra impacts our lives not just in our yoga practices, but especially outside, on and off the mat. So let's begin. Um, the goal of Tantra. So the goal of Tantra is to break down the walls that separate the sacred to everyday life. Or in other words, to unify our everyday life to what is sacred. You know this idea that we do yoga for 90 minutes? sometimes even less, maybe 60. And then the other 22 point half hours of the day, we're not doing yoga. That's not what the ancient masters always wanted for us. They want us to practice yoga, 60 to 90 minutes, whatever that is. But then the other time, continue doing yoga. So yoga never ends. Another question, why do you guys think that yoga have a short life? And this is a little bit of a sticky conversation. Anyone want to guess why? Octavio, you put me on the spot the other week. Why do you think yoga have a short life? So your question is why, why does the effect of yoga not last very long? 
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. And, and also, <laughs> thank you. It's just a paying back, you know that, right? Yeah. Um, so other week he put me on the spot to say something as well. So um, also adding to what he beautifully explained, it's exactly that. So if our life Monday to Friday is shit, we are in a chaos, we are running around crazy, erratic, arguing to pe people, fighting with our husbands, our wives, uh, being mad. And then because everything is so chaotic on a Saturday morning, I need to go to yoga class to forget about the word. It's not going to last because the yoga going to have that beautiful feeling for 60 minutes. But as soon as we get out of yoga, it continues. The, con the same thing continues if we don't address what is in life, perhaps, that's happening. In yoga is where we address that. And here's when sometimes things get a little bit turned, like we get um, attached to yoga being a form of escapism. So we want a yoga to be fun. We want a yoga teachers to be entertaining, funny. We want a yoga teachers to put music so we can feel a little funky going on. So we can actually forget everything what's happening. But then as soon as the yoga class finish, what happened? Do we come back to the world and freak out? So um, what really triggered me was as Steph said today, and that really stick with me, she said today, every time I get triggered, I said, come at me. That's what she said today. And that really resonates. It's like what triggered me is that then when I heard yoga is not about fun, I became curious about that. The moment I heard yoga is not about entertainment, and music and everything. Yoga is about the path of self-realization. That triggers something in me to become curious. Because if yoga is not fun, so what? Yoga is a moment that we can actually sit with ourselves to observe what's going on. And initially it's not fun. Initially. But the idea to remember throughout the right techniques that we do, that ultimately we are a soul. When life becomes not fun, when things outside life is a little bit sticky, that is to remember that, that we are the sacred, that we are God when things are not fun. That we don't need the fun, we don't need the music, we don't need entertainment all the time to remember that. But there is a set of techniques and there is a way of practicing that we will address that and we're going to talk a little bit more as we go ideal is that we feel that life outside yoga is as sacred as life when we practice yoga and if sometimes we practice yoga things feels a little bit sticky and confronting is an opportunity for us to reflect and observe what is triggering why maybe perhaps I have the urge that I need to put some music on so I cannot think about that. It's an invitation to observe. Does that make sense? Okay. Here is where um, we have these three intertwined systems. Ayurveda, which takes care of the body and health. Yoga, which takes care of the mind. And Tantra, which is about energy and power. So these three sciences, they are very ancient and they come from thousands of years ago. And they all work together. They should be working together. Ayurveda is the science that takes care of our health and makes us balance. So when we are doing yoga and Tantra, we are more healthy and ready for it. If you ever try to meditate when you are sick... It's really, really hard. So Ayurveda is the science that allows us to feel more balanced and healthy with life, with ourselves and the environment. So when we practice our yoga, we can really absorb the practices. We can really get it. <clears throat> now, yoga is about the mind. 
traditionally. Oh, but I want to get flexible. But traditionally is about the mind. Um, this really awesome dude, Patanjali, created the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali thousands of years ago, and to this day is the most referred yoga book for practitioners who want to step a little bit deeper. And his sutras, 196 of them, all of them, 192 of them, it speaks about, in some way, the mind. Only four of them don't. It speaks about poses. All the others, in some way, addresses our mind. And even the sutras that speaks about poses is actually how to do postures in a way that impact the mind. So yoga, traditionally, is about the mind. Getting the hamstring stretch, the core strength, is just like a, a bonus. And Tantra is about energy. It's the cultivator of power. And it's not power over people. It's not power to run the world. It's power to overcome our own bullshit. It's the power to overcome the things that limit us in life, that oftentimes makes us to feel victimized, the times that we blame others. It's the power to overcome all those things and sit with ourselves and take responsibility for all what's around us because we do have the power to overcome all that. And Tantra is the cultivation of that power. And once we cultivate that power, we begin to direct this power to a certain purpose. While yoga is about content, Tantra is about momentum. While yoga is about non-dualism, Tantra is about the dualism. Other way. Uh, no, dualism, that's right. So we live in a world both of meta and the world of spirit. We live both lives. Tantra acknowledged that we are modern humans out in the world. We don't live in the caves. We don't live in the mountains. So we need to live a life where we can make the most. Does that make sense? So here we go. I made this a slide with a lot of love for you guys, with a lot of words that sort of represents the word Tantra. And there is more to it, but these are the ones that I want to show tonight. The first one, a system with precise methods. Methods that allows us to master our energy and our minds and our lives. This system is Hatha Yoga. Hatha is the methodology on how we do that. How we're going to master our energy, how we're going to master our minds. And the idea we do that is to accelerate our path of karma. So when we do th these systems, when we do these methods, we begin to accelerate our purification. So that's when shit happens. That's when life begins to really test you. And, you, and if you guys have that before, when you decide something, and the moment you decide, life actually throws you exactly what you need to show how committed you are with whatever you have decided. Yeah? Happen on a daily basis here in, in Bali, right? The energy here is so strong. So it's to accelerate. So simultaneously, we, things going to come to us to use us as a vessel of purification. It's like, like Steph said today, come at me. Show me what I need to know. Show me what I don't know and perhaps I need to learn. That's the sticky part. But on the other hand, if we succeed in seeing those things and the way how we see those things, we begin to see that something very special starts to rise in that. Our power to overcome our own limitations, our power to overcome our own um, self-belief or limited belief thinking. Here is when we begin to evolve. Like we have said a couple of times, there is this very lovely saying here, the practice, Evolve or die. It's on our YTT teacher training book. And here is my favorite one. You are protected. 
the moment you commit to this path, the moment you commit to, a, to this path of self-realization or tantra or energy work, believe that you are protected. Things don't happen to you, they happen for you. You know, and sometimes you think you should be doing it in one way, but then life doesn't want you to go in that way and kind of like re redirect you. And then initially you're like, oh, I really don't want this, but actually we're protected. You're protected from something that doesn't mean to be yours. And perhaps there is something else for you. The sages, the masters are always protecting us. Believe that when things happen, it's not a bad thing. And when we see in that way, we see that when those things happen, everything is divine. You liking it or not, your boyfriend cheated on you, is the divine telling you something? Yeah. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost a friend. Maybe even death. It, it owes the divine showing us a path that perhaps we didn't know before. As sometimes as hard to swallow that as it is, it's all a gift. It's all Shri, as we say. It's all the divinity. I forgot to put the word as everything is divine. Okay. When we see that everything is divine, this other word come up. Auspiciousness. What is auspiciousness? Parka. Your life is always suspicious. And it, um, it's a good sign. Yeah. You know, it's always a good sign. It's an auspicious sign. It's uh, something positive for me. Um, and it's, yeah, it's to say the truth in all things. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's a possibility of something good to happen. Something good is happening. Even though mine doesn't feel like at the beginning, Auspicious is like, oh, this is happening. Mm, what is in there? <clears throat> That's a big word for Tantra. And once we see things as auspicious, we begin to weave through life. We begin to dance through life. As life becomes this dance of like, something good happened, something bad happened. Like Pima Chandra, the, ba the beautiful um, Buddhist uh, monk, she says, we don't really know. Sometimes good things happen, sometimes bad things happen, but we don't really know. There is always a verge of something auspicious that could come out of that. And the word Kundalini or spiritual awakening comes in here, and that's very, very misused these days. Um, Kundalini or spiritual awakening is not like an airy-fairy conversation. It's not something like out there. It's actually just the realization of those other words. It's just our worldview. It's just beginning to polish our third eye and begin to see that life is accelerating us to see something special, that everything happens for a reason. Could, we could think that's good or bad, but it's actually an auspicious moment to realize something that maybe we didn't know before. We start to expand and see perception of life with a little bit more a broader view. And that's how we begin to master our energy and master our lives. With that comes freedom, fulfillment, and accomplishment. Freedom from suffering. Fulfillment that we, we understand that we are divine. We are content. We are enough. And accomplishment because the desire of our soul, right? As the first conversation we did, our soul wants us to do good in this life and want us to work for good things, to serve. And that's where the accomplishment comes, from the Dharma, from serving our purpose. And here we go. And yeah, those two. Then there is a couple other words, cause and effect, yantra and mantra. Yantra is like our internal geometric numerology is like the 
yoga numerology. Can I say that? Okay, partial is a yoga numerology. Is how our ge our geometric shape is inside in numbers. Mantra is the essence, is the true essence of yoga, is the result. And the word energy, prana, and power is the biggest one. Is here where we cultivate all our self power to overcome whatever limited belief we have that we don't believe that we are all that. We use mostly meditation and meditation to do that. And these two words, Purush and Prakriti. Purush is the pa part of us that is always steady, it's always unchangeable, it's our soul. And Prakriti is the part of us that's always changing, it's the part of us that's capable to evolve. So here we have parts of us that is steady, the soul, who is always there watching life happen. And then we have Prakriti, the one who is actually dancing through life and making life happen, is the creation. There is one word missing. Do you guys know which one? Right in the corner. You get a brownie cookie if you know. <laughs> which is 0.0.0002%. But I have to put this in there because if you Google like I did 10 years ago what Tantra is, when some sort of movie and book came out, it's very different than all those other conversations that we talk about, but it is part of it. But it's not as it seems like. I'm not going to spend too much time on that because it's such a small part of it. And I went to a, a rabbit hole this weekend when I was doing this presentation, watching on YouTube, uh, because I want to learn about where the sex part comes from. And it was really bizarre and really weird. And there is nothing to do with the path, path of mastering the mind. And it's just, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> our soul has three main desires. Our beautiful teacher, Rod Stryker, he's the teacher of most of the teachers here at the practice. He, um, he says that our soul initially have three main desires that have manifested this body to be here in this life. The first desire is related to the planet. The second desire is related to family. And the third is with, with tradition. I, could, I put my family there. So the planet is that we, we leave this planet, the soul have a desire to serve the planet and leave this planet better than how we found. I'm not too sure how good we are at this job at this moment, but I do believe, I actually do believe that there is a power of consciousness growing now in a certain community and people are becoming much, much more aware. And then hopefully that we can actually leave this planet in some way better than we found. The family is related that our soul have a desire to heal our family karmic path. The things that we carry from our family that comes like unhelpful behaviors, patterns, and things that we all carry in some way that no longer serves us. Does anyone have one of those? Things that have been engraved in us from past generations. And the tradition, our soul desire to pass on a message. There is a beautiful message before us that's greater than us. And that message can pass through us to serve others. And here, guys, doesn't mean you need to be a yoga teacher. That message could be passed at any tradition. It doesn't even have to be a tantra <coughs> tradition or yoga tradition. It could be just the way how you live your life. How you show up with your force of the spirit every single day to people in front of you. You could be a doctor. You could be a chef, a bus driver. How are you impacting the souls that you are carrying with you every day or is crossing your path every day? And that is the soul desire in tradition. In some way, live life spiritually that we are serving with reverence. 
I think that's such a beautiful thing. And I am eternally grateful for the practice, for this gift of being here and being able to share my message in some way. The good news is, as we can start in this, exactly where we are. So I wanted to show this video here tonight, which is a video from my very first presentation here, the practice. It's just one minute, but the speaker is not working, so I'm going to quickly say what it is. This is Paramahansa Yogananda, which is up there, and then he's here. That's one of his disciples, and he comes to Paramahansa Yogananda and asks, Guruji, my whole life I have heard that to be on this spiritual path, I need to renounce life. But now you say, if I want to have alcohol, I can have alcohol. If I want to have promiscuous sex, I can have promiscuous sex. If I want to buy material things, I can buy material things. And Yogananda replied back to him and said, yes, you can do all that. But I cannot guarantee to you that if you continue doing these practices of being self-aware, that you're going to have a desire to do those things that are not in alignment with your soul purpose. You like that one, Brian? Yeah? Amen? Okay. So that means we all have a human life to live and go through our own path of learning and understanding things. But the path of Tantra Yoga is not a renouncement. It's not a path that we're going to push away things. In fact, we got given this life to make the most of it. Differently than what classical yoga says. Classical yoga says you should renounce, go down and meditate, renounce your family, renounce even your body, renounce your material things, just meditate. Tantra said, no, make the most of everything, learn in the process, learn as you go. If you want to buy a house, if you want to buy a car, if you want to go out and party and dance, if you want to drink alcohol, if you want to do things, do it. Just do it consciously. Because the path of yoga and tantra, they are the same. The goal is samadhi. But one is through renouncing and the other one is through embracing. Is that right? Just asking my team there if everything is okay. <laughs> Are you watching? Okay. So here... It's all Shri. <coughs> it's all divinity. This picture is for about more or less seven, eight years ago when I actually started to go hard in yoga. That's when I kind of like, I want to do yoga every day, and I did. I was hard into the more physical yoga, but was my yoga it served me at that point as, as it was. And um, I have very zero skills in meditation then, but I love my yoga path for what it was. It served me then. The reason why I want to put this picture here is because there is a little story that I want to share with you. And you know, most of you guys know I'm Brazilian. I come from a very hot, a little bit wild culture. I like to dance. I like to party. I like to drink alcohol and have fun. Liked. And, um, <laughs> but my family history have a hard problem with alcohol. Every single male in my family's father's side have a serious problem with alcohol. And uh, in fact, my, my father's brother died at my age today, like uh, 32, 33, he passed away of alcohol poison. So very funny how things work in this world. Um, recently in our recent YTT, Octavio was doing a lecture and that really landed me because he was talking about the three soul desires to heal family, heal the planet, and heal the and, and serve the tradition in some way. When I met my teacher Rod Stryker, the very same month after a very funny episode of my life, I decided to never drink alcohol again. That was two and a half years ago. And without knowing, I met him and literally Two weeks later, I decide I'm not drinking alcohol anymore. This is not serving. I can't meditate. Some shit happened. It's not serving me at this point. And you know, I had to go through my own path to be able to understand and now understand a little bit deeper 
that alcohol was a big thing in my family. All my family always used alcohol as a form of escapism, of distraction, of distract our, their fears. My family is very fearful in some way, and they use alcohol to release of that fear. I didn't know then why I stopped drinking alcohol, I just have this urge. And that's why I believe that we are always protected. We are protecting some way the tradition will guide you through just, maybe through some shit you realize, this is not for me anymore. Fast forward now to this time, I'm getting in peace with alcohol. I haven't drank since, but maybe if I feel like I would have a glass of wine with my boyfriend in a romantic dinner, I would have it. I would do that because now I don't use alcohol as a distraction anymore. I healed that a little bit. For two and a half years, I have been practicing deep yoga without needing that distraction. Just that me and my boyfriend do other things for fun. But, um, yeah, so I think like if things heal. This is just an example. There is many other ways how this situation could apply from our, you guys like that photo? I was wild. I'm sure I was a little bit, but I was more. I needed meditation. Alcohol was not serving me. So I had to have this break to get in peace with now and, you know, do things more consciously. Do in a way that I'm more, more conscious about it. And again, Tantra understands that we are not monks. We don't live in caves and we have a life to live. Just we need to do it mindfully. Now there is a system, here we go, that allows us to see our own things, to also build power to overcome them. And here is the system, the seven stages of Hatha Yoga. Who has seen the system before? I might have presented a couple times. Uh, but I will present it, I think the whole entire world can see it because it's so beautiful and really guides us to our evolutionary path of yoga. Yoga should evolve. As we evolve, our yoga practice should evolve. The first two stages, purification and strengthening. Here's when we take like sundown beach pictures in a bikini. That's me, that, by the way, so I'm mocking myself. I thought if I'm going to mock someone tonight, it's going to be me and Octavio. <laughs> Because he has pictures doing back bends in his motorbike. <laughs> I saved them in case he, because he deleted his Instagram, but I have the picture saved. <laughs> and uh, in this stage, obviously, is a preparatory stage and is related to our body. Purification is about sweating and clearing up the body a little bit. You know, we hold the stagnation, toxicity from our lives. So a little bit of movement, a little bit of sweat in this point is good because we want to clear up whatever feels like toxin. Also, we want to strengthen the body so our body is more stable and perhaps we can sit in meditation for a little longer. Traditionally, purification is related to postures. So our postures are opening up our channels. We have 72,000 of channels in the body. When they are stagnant, these channels block our energy from moving and therefore it's even hard to meditate. So we want to do poses to clear up those channels. That's related to the purification. Strengthening traditionally is related to make our spine a little bit stronger. If we fast forward to the end of the seven stages, is meditation, we need to meditate. If our lower backs are rubbish, if our lower backs are weak and we can't sit very well, our meditation will be really tough. Our lower backs start to ache, we have lower back pain, we can't really sit straight for more than two, three minutes. So strengthening traditionally is to make the spinal muscles stronger so we can actually sit a little bit longer when we meditate. Hmm. Now, why do you think, guys, sometimes we heard this thing, I'm a little bit bored at yoga? You guys ever heard of that? Have you got bored doing yoga? Be honest. I have got bored in yoga when I was just doing postures. Because there was a point, like, how much poses can you do? How much can you hold a handstand for 10 minutes? Like, what, what's, what's this about? It, when things are just physical, they become a little bit boring. 
things need to have a little bit more depth. And here's when um, we need to ask ourselves, what is the next stage? What is the question? Who knows it? Yeah, but what is the actual question that you have to ask yourself, Ryan? Did you raise your hand? Yeah. That's one way. You can say, it's also in our teacher training book, do I want to be flexible or do I want to be free and happy? Here's where we draw the line of question. And then we move into the next stage. The stage three and four, which is related to calming and stabilizing. What calming is? What that means, get calm in yoga? Fold forward, twist, long breath out, hold poses a little bit long, sit still, meditate. Why we don't like that? Why? Yeah, we're busy. So the, 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 um, we're busy normally in life. We are humans who have jobs, family, and we study and do a lot of things. So then sitting in meditation is going to be confronting. It's confronting. Oh, wow, there's a lot going on. I don't want to be here. Let's do something else. The job of the mind is to keep us busy. The job of the mind is to actually make us busy. So that is the moment when we need to give a little bit of resilience to ourselves and sit in the stillness and pass the point when the minds want to distract you. Because the job of the mind is to keep you distracted. So at this point, sit a little bit, even if it feels uncomfortable. And begin to work on those practices that make you calm. So what we do here at the practice, the moon classes, which is a lot of folding forward, some twists, the meditation and the breath work is related to those postures so we can actually calm down a little bit. But calm down is not that hard. The hard is to stay calm. That's the stability. Here is the question again, where does your calmness go when someone is provoking you? Where does your calmness go when you receive a big bill? Where does the calmness go when you are family or friends or partner are challenging you and you are having an argument, perhaps. That's a stability. Remain calm. So there is also techniques that we do that. Hold the poses. Feel uncomfortable and stay calm, remain still. That's a, such a key for meditation. Sit there even if you don't like it. Because sometimes life is going to be like that. And it doesn't mean we push the first two stages away, the postures. We continue doing poses the whole way through. It's just the way how we approach is slightly different. Then the next stage is two stages. It's sensitize and direct. But what? Like here's again this like crazy crystal lady. Directing and expanding what? What is that thing? Prana, energy. We begin to sensitize that there is something beyond muscles and bones. And we use prana to wake that thing inside. Prana wakes us internally. So there is three main words to understand prana. And primarily, they are vitality, intelligence, and healing. If our prana is a little bit weak, often our body immune system is low. We need vitality to overcome illness. We need energy and prana to overcome illness in the body. Intelligence is related to a force that we tap into. That's it's knowledge. That's what we do in meditation. And healing is related to when we are aware of this intelligence and when we are aware of this vital energy, we can start to use that to our own self-healing and maybe eventually even heal others. Does that make sense so far? We sensitize it and then we expand it. How we sensitize it? 
to postures, to breath work, to be still after that, to notice something going on in the, internally, in the hands, on the heart. Depends the posture, depends on what we're doing. And then we direct with mudra. We can use the hands to do movements and direct the energy. If we are more skilled, we can do Kriya meditations and do that internally. Inhale from the third eye to the navel and so on, and you can move things inside. Like we do here at the practice. You know, it's not hard to sensitize energy. If you are an empath person, you can sensitize energy easy, actually. You can feel others. You can feel the environment. You can feel things. But if the other stages are not mastered, often empath uh, people who are empathics, is that right, empathics, they struggle. Because if the mind is not calm and stable, they will absorb too much and, and, and feel too much. So the first stages are really important before we begin to go deep into sensitizing. <clears throat> and the final stage, illumination, which is related to spirit awakening or kundalini or the word fire. The Rig Veda, which is the ancient, ancient script or text, says right at the beginning, right at the open, I meditate on the fire. I meditate on the soul. And here's where when our practice are a dance in between. It's like bittersweet. The bitter is that we've got to have here to build prana and energy enough to over overcome our limited belief thinking, the things that has been holding us back in life. But at the same time is where we begin to tap into our own strength and know that we are that strength. We have divinity within us and we can also see divinity in everything in life. In fire, we do an intentional provocation called tapas. Have you guys been here to fire classes at the practice? Yeah? So the intentional provocation, which creates an internal heat. There is different techniques to do that. If we can succeed, gracefully handle the heat, there is something that shines through us. Which what the ancient, all the ancient masters, and including, including <coughs> Jesus Christ, have that shine in the eyes, which is overcome difficult situations with grace. Some people would do that in yoga. They would deliberately provoke themselves so they can actually purify and, 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 and polish a little bit the personality. There are some people that will eat life to do that. You know, when life is giving a sign, all the time, and then the signs become a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and bigger, and then we have to do something about it, we have to change. And there are some people that by nature have gone through some things in life that forces them to see that strength within, that their eyes are shining because maybe they have gone through very, very serious things in life, and they overcame that with grace and, and beauty, inner beauty. In fire, we begin to polish our personality with resilience because our soul wants us to shine. Our soul wants to shine through our eyes. Our soul wants us to do our mission here in this earth, which is related to the planet, to the family, and to serve in certain way. And it's not going to be easy. There is no certainty that this path will be easy all the time. It's actually not. The moment you decide to be on the path, the universe will challenge you to see how much you want it. And fire is our ability to, to burn to the things that make us to don't believe in ourselves, to burn our story. And it's not that we become fearless. I don't like much that. I don't like to say we are fearless. I know there is something in, someone in the room agreeing with me. Um, you know, it's not that we don't have fear. The fear is there. But fire allows us to build courage so we can show up even though we feel fear. Because actually acting, I read a book really cool recently called uh, The Big Magic. And it says like if we actually act all the time out of fear, fearless, it's quite dangerous. We want to feel something and we also want to be considered of others. 
And if we do feel a fear towards something or perhaps a trigger, it's just that we act with courage. Does that make sense? You know, it's not easy to stand here tonight. All my presentations have a little background story all the time that freaks me out. From the first one to today, always something. Perhaps today was a little bit sweet. I got a surprise. My boyfriend arrived in time. He was going to miss the presentation. He just arrived. So it feels sweet, but you know, the fire of life will heat you up. And just like fire, we have all the time that opportunity to see all we harden or we transform because that's what fire does all we're going to allow the fire to touch us and we don't like and we harden up and we create all the shell shelves and run away or we build that courage from somewhere and show up it never gets easier but the courage gets bigger. Here is the seven stages. <clears throat> if you are curious, this weekend I'm doing a workshop where I am going to go through the stages in depth when you're going to be practicing all the stages. And there is an intelligence <laughs> sequencing in those stages. So guys, we don't do everything at the same time. There is a misunderstanding more modern yoga that we can do all sorts of poses together. No, certain poses are related to get calm and stable. Certain poses are related to enliven energy, and certain poses are related to fire. We can't just mix everything with all sorts of breaths and do all sorts of meditation. It doesn't make sense. That's when we get sometimes a little bit confused. So if you are interested, there is a path where you can actually skillfully know these are the poses that we do with this breath work, with this meditation, for this specific reason. And then we move through it, depends which stage we are. We never progress in these stages, so that means we're always going to do purification and strengthening, we're always going to work on the mind, and we're always going to be aware of energy. We never graduate. So we do poses, we do breath, and we do meditation. The whole way through is just how we do it. It should be like a, a gradual process, like a, a flower blossoming, not aggressive. So that's why we go into stages. And traditionally, each stage will be like from two to three years each. So expect that it takes 12 to 14 years to be able to master this. Right? Like, but we are in a society that we want things very quickly. Like in one month, I want a Kundalini to arise. It can actually, but if the first stages are not stabilized, it can be dangerous. Not dangerous, but can be disturbing. That's when we can get confused, not know what to do with life, or act out of rage, cut everyone out suddenly. So we need to be progressive so we are progressively evolving to that point. I love this, thanks to Jana. <laughs> Asanas are just the tip of the, the thing. And they're super important, but there is so much more to it. This is the... Um, a very, very beautiful page from our manual on the YTT, the 200 hour. And the sense of Tantra Hatha Yoga is stabilize your mind first, cultivate energy, generate subtle heat in the navel to melt the limitations, to awaken our power, our force, so we can connect to our own heart, our own soul, our own purpose, so we can leave this purpose and serve others. That's the map. Simple, right? Yeah. There's no fun all the time. And there is no music all the time. But it's so worth it. I want to finish with um, this word. Adhikara is a Sanskrit word. The right to know. The process by which you and your practice will evolve over time. In other words... Your practice should and will change as you change. Adhikara is our evolution as a practitioner and as a person. We become a refined seeker, more aware, more in tune with the sacred.
my life has been really, really touched by this tradition, by my both teachers, Octavio and Rod Stryker. And it is like an incredible gift to be here. It's like an honor to be able to teach yoga, to teach these beautiful practices, to, to connect to people like you guys, and, and, and to be on a, such a sacred space. Because let's be realistic, it's not everyone in the world that's like this. And being here and be able to feel that, all of us being here tonight, it's, it's very auspicious. <laughs> Once Rod Stryker said that on his training here at the practice last year, that Tantra is not about studying. Tantra is about receiving. It's a received knowledge. When we are ready, the teacher appears. The teacher can be coming, can, comes in many different forms. So, let's plug in. If you are around this weekend, I am doing a workshop, and it's on Tantra, two days. We're going to be exploring the seven stages, understanding the functionality of poses, the power of the breath. We're going to be doing a lot of meditation and study the parts of the mind and doing some lectures on um, the traditional philosophy in mind in yoga. So if you want to know more about it, just ask me or go in the reception. Uh, tonight is the final sign up to get the discount price then also if you want to plug in something at the end of july i'm running a retreat with a very beautiful friend of mine also hatha yoga teacher and rod striker student we're going to be doing a bali yoga retreat for six days six nights a lot of hatha and ayurveda she's also an ayurveda teacher and if you want to become a yoga teacher those two gems there in the door, Octave and Karina, wave your hands. <laughs> they are running a teacher training, and we have a couple of spots, which is also starting this weekend for 30 days. So you have here some guidance if you want to. If you're not, if you just want to chat, come and chat, or I see you around the classes. Thank you for being here, guys. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs>